Newsmaker Sunday with Fox 10's John Hook. Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Sunday. Last week we had uh, Senate candidate Will Cardin on the challenger in the Republican primary. Jeff Flake, another challenger in the Republican primary for U.S. Senate out of Arizona, our guest this week on Newsmaker Thanks for Sunday. Me. Good to see you. Um, we had Will Cardin on last week, and um, this has been a rough and tumble campaign. <laughs> Did you expect this it from has. a guy? You guys go back a long way. I mean, he yeah. donated to your campaigns. He was a supporter of yours. Were you surprised, first of all, he ran? Yeah, I was. I, I never thought that we would be alone in the primary. I mean, these Senate seats come along, uh, frequency of Haley's Comet, these open Senate right. seats. We've only had 10 U.S. Senators. And so I, I fully expected uh, it to be a tough race, a tough primary. But I didn't expect uh, one of my former supporters to get in the race. But having said that, everyone has a right to run, and uh, and he's run a race, and um, that's fine. Is I, it this, is not, this is not my seat. Is this it personally is harmful, seat. though? I mean, is it tough to, to kind of get through? Because you guys are in the same church. Yeah. I mean, I, this is, it's odd. Know, it's, uh, I've been in, in politics a while, and uh, I, you know, it's, I think it's easier for the candidate uh, to, to get through it. It's, I think it's tougher on families and mutual friends um, yeah, I've heard because that it, a lot. Puts, it puts people in a tough spot. So I, I won't say it's been easy, but, uh, but this seat is an Arizona seat. It's not my seat uh, to have, and uh, we fully expected to have a race, and it came from a different quarter than I thought, but that's okay. His biggest quarrel with you, and I'm going to run right. the sound, he says that what pushed him over the edge to run was your term limits pledge right. that you made back in 2000. Right. Um, let, let me run the sound, and I want to get your reaction. This was Will Cardin last week. Jeff Flake looked me in the eye 12 years ago and said, I will not become a career politician, Will. I will leave Washington, D.C. I've made a term limit pledge. I will keep my word. And he didn't. He ran the spot right. where you you yeah. said, I lied. <laughs> right. You were being honest, <laughs> right. but you'd had to change your heart about it because you felt right. you bet. what? Well, first, let me say, I, I don't remember that conversation at all. I, I really don't. Um, but I did make a term limit pledge. I believed at that time it was the right thing to do. Uh, a lot of people were taking those pledges. A lot of Washington, the entire institution of Congress, uh, uh, committee chairmen were term limited. Some still are, some aren't now. We've just kind of moved beyond it. And Your I did, predecessor I wasn't had there, made right? that pledge he as did, well, Matt He Salmon. did, and I kept it. Uh, he kept it, and I admire him for it. And, uh, and, but when I was there for a while, I, I, I started thinking, you know, there are issues like the earmark issue that uh, I'd started. That was a, a many-year effort, and we finally have a ban on earmarks. Had I left in 2006, uh, as I had planned to, uh, we wouldn't have got that. And, and uh, I think that, you know, it's, it's, I, I admire those who, uh, who took a pledge and kept it like my predecessor. Um, but, uh, but I can honestly say that when I went back there, I thought it was the right thing to do, and I changed my mind. And I think politicians and anybody in life is, is allowed to do that. Um, let's talk about that for just a minute, because just philosophically, there are a lot of people um, who think that the problem in Washington mm -hmm. is that people stay around too yeah. long. How do you avoid falling into that trap if, if you're running now for yeah. a Senate seat that could be six more years? Well, it is a trap, and, and a lot of people, you look around when you get back there and you think, man, I wish that guy would have retired a long time ago. He has gone to Washington. And that, that certainly happens to some, but then you look at somebody like John Kyle, and, and you think, he's been back there now 26 years, and I think everyone in Arizona and a lot of people around the country uh, are darn glad that he spent every year of it there. He's the third mo most powerful man in the Senate. He now. is. He is. You, uh, that's how you gain uh, seniority, certainly, and, and how you have more influence. But he's had good, consistent, conservative leadership his entire time there. And, and then you see some other people. I always think of uh, Henry Hyde. Henry Hyde was there 30-some years. He retired, and a year later he died. And I had the privilege of serving with him his last six years, six or eight years. And, uh, and I often thought, boy, the institutional memory that he has, he was the author of the Hyde Amendment uh, for, for years um, that we still have around. So some grow. of this is good. It, the yeah, experience and, and, and is good, you believe? It is. It can be a detriment, uh, and it, it depends on the individual. Um, for myself, 
In my first two years there, uh, I was only the second most conservative uh, member of, of the House and the right. Senate. After that, uh, I became the most fiscally conservative. And so the longer I've spent there, I think I've likely become more fiscally conservative. And so you, it doesn't happen with everyone. You received the highest score in the House of Representatives from the National Taxpayers Union, right. which rates members of Congress on their dedication to lower taxes, smaller government, and economic freedom by analyzing every roll call vote <laughs> affecting fiscal policy. Right. Um, and earmarks is really your, that's been your cornerstone. Right. Right. The National Taxpayers Union takes every vote that you cast that has a tax or spending implication and they rank members of Congress one through 535, not an A grade or B grade or C, rank. but number one through 535. And for eight years straight, I ranked at the top of that list. And so that's why it just when I see these ads that, that call Flake a liberal and he's uh, right where Obama is and a uh, big spender, right. I think... Where in the world are these coming from? Well, and, so. I, and I asked Will Cardin that exact uh -huh. question last week. Let me play it for you and I'll get your right. response. This is Will Cardin a week ago. No. You wouldn't argue, would you, that Jeff Flake is conservative? I mean, he ran the Goldwater Institute. He's a pretty conservative guy. I, I would argue that he has not had a conservative voting record when you get, actually get into it and look at it. He voted to increase the debt ceiling. He voted. Well, a he lot was, of people <laughs> voted to, you know, increase the debt ceiling. We were we were playing brinksmanship in a very dangerous yeah, and, game, and, and it's gotten us into a bad position. I don't think that's what, what conservative. What would the alternative have been, and how well, would you? Let me let me go through okay. the list first. He he he's, he was a proponent and wrote the bill for amnesty. He wrote a cap and trade bill, an energy tax bill. Uh, he skipped the vote on the on Obama's cap and trade that narrowly passed. He's never once voted for funding of Israel. He voted against sanctions on Iran and Syria. You go on and on the list. It it it's a pretty big list. Jeff Flake is our guest on Newsmaker Sunday. Do you want to respond to any of that oh, litany of stuff he laid out? Anybody who's been in Congress for a year or more um, has cast thousands of votes. And rarely do you vote on a single subject bill. Uh, boy. And so let me, let me just give you one example. Uh, one thing that uh, my opponent has brought up many times is Jeff Fl voted against the Keystone Pipeline. Now, the Keystone Pipeline, uh, we've put in several pieces of legislation, and Republicans will tend to put it in just to embarrass the Democrats and force them to vote against it on popular pieces of legislation. So I probably voted for the Keystone Pipeline a dozen times or so. Uh, but one time, the Republican leadership decided to put it as part of the payroll tax extension, which added about $120 billion to the deficit. And I voted against that bill. So technically, you could say Jeff voted against the Keystone Pipeline. But what I was really voting against was $130 billion added to our deficit. And so that's, that's mm -hmm. where it, it, it's difficult uh, if you've been in office at all, uh, because there's all, there will always be votes, always be votes that uh, people will point to and say, well, we can paint you this way or we can paint you that way. Um, because you aren't voting on single subject bills. Take the other one, he said, I, I voted against aid to Israel. I do support aid to Israel. Uh, but each time we've supported or we've voted on that, it's been part of the big foreign aid bill. And so you'll often have uh, c candidates saying, I don't want foreign aid, but I do like aid to Israel. They're all the same bill. Right. It's just one bill, and so it 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 makes it's for confusing good, to voters. It, it is, and it makes for a good, you know, television commercial or a good soundbite. But and that's why the nice thing is today with the internet, it's so easy for people to go in and actually check, uh, you know, people's records in their entirety, or to look at something like the National Taxpayers Union that takes every vote you take, and 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 norms them, and and so that's. That's the nice thing. There are ways that people can see. And what I've found is with these commercials, uh, when my opponent says something like, uh, Jeff Flake has never had a job in the private sector. You know, that he is, did say that. <laughs> that, that yes, is he so, did. That is so outlandish. Uh, I went to Congress when I was 38 years old. I've never had any inherited wealth. And so I've had to have jobs that I've, you know, through college, uh, Every job that I've had uh, wasn't you know, in a family business. I had to find them on my own. And uh, like I said, I've, I've worked in the private sector some 20 years before I went to Congress. So to make a statement like that is just so over the top and so outlandish that I think few believe it. And, and that's this a is, good thing. This is why uh, Senator Kyle and Senator McCain jumped in, right? Because they don't want to see you as a fellow Republican damaged before right. the main event, which right. is likely you and Richard Carmona. Right, right. And when you see ads where 
uh, President Obama has been photoshopped into one of my press conferences. We or, talked about that as or, well. Or, or I, I'm talking to members that are described as lobbyists when they're actually two members of Congress. Uh, you think, you know, can't we do any better than that? And that's what, that's what prompted Senator Kyle and Senator McCain to get in the race. Well, before we move on, I want to just ask you quickly, you talk about this, the stuff that ends up in bills. Right. Where you can't just vote them cleanly. Right. Don't we have this going on with the farm bill right now? Isn't you, much you of the farm bill for food stamps? Am I right about this? Oh, yes. Uh, the farm bill is really about 80% of the farm bill is a so-called nutrition title. And that's, uh, that's food stamps, which have been growing just at a rapid, rapid pace over the past couple of years. Uh, the other 20% is, is really corporate welfare. And that's objectionable, too. And so there, there are many elements of that. Uh, we just passed a, a small disaster part of that and uh, kicked the can down the road on the farm bill. Do we need a lot more money for food stamps and assistance? I mean, people, I understand that, that there are people hurting, but have we grown this thing out of control? We have, and the, the guidelines are too loose right now, and uh, it allows people, I think, uh, to, uh, to be in the system who who weren't before and will likely be in the system too long, and, and that's unfortunate. Um, let me move on to tape number six, the Supreme Court ruling on health care and on SB 1070. Um, first of all, health care. When people start talking about, I will repeal Obamacare when I get into office, it's not that easy. No. First of all, if the president's reelected, he's not going to ever sign off on any repeal of Obamacare, right. his signature legislation. So all this hot air about this, can it actually be diminished in some way? Can you fund it or defund it, I guess is a proper yeah. word. Can that be done? Well, we in the if House. If you disagree with it. We in the House have passed uh, repeal legislation. We've repealed it outright. We've taken specific parts of it and repealed. I think we've either repealed it outright or parts of it 31 times now. Uh, but the Senate, obviously, under Democratic leadership, isn't going to take that bill up or any of those bills. Um, so, but assuming that we take control of the Senate, and if Barack Obama is still in the White House, we can, through the reconciliation process, defund uh, many parts of it. Likely? It, it's kind of, a, yes, I, I do think likely. The bottom line is Obamacare is going to fall of its own weight. Um, I hope that we can repeal it before it does, because if it does fall of its own weight, it will come at a time when uh, when a lot of damage has been done in the meantime. You're talking the, about economic damage, yeah, fiscal damage. The, the assumptions that have been made with Obamacare in terms of the number of people that private employers uh, will keep on their roles, um, or, or uh, I mean keep insurance for mm -hmm. private employees right. on their roles, or dump them into the, uh, the exchanges, has been so underestimated. Uh, that it will mean just a massive, massive, massive subsidy that we can ill afford with the federal government right now. And so it, it, it will fall of its own weight. I hope we can repeal it before that time. We, we've been talking on this program for a while about how we are now uh, in, terms of, in terms of government as part of GDP, gross mm -hmm. domestic product. It's now at about 24 percent. Historically, it's been under 20, right. either around 20 or under 20. Government is growing. Mm -hmm. Is there any stopping it? Oh, there has to be. I mean, we, uh, th when your debt equals your GDP, which it does right now, that is usually the point at which um, countries just can't sell bonds anymore. You can't sell your debt anymore. Uh, we've been given a bit of a reprieve because we still look good when you grade on the curve. The, the rest of the country is in such a mess. Uh, Europe, with, yeah. with pension liability issues, with Asia, with their long-term issues, uh, we've been given a bit of a reprieve. We're the, still the world's world, uh, you know, reserve currency. But that won't last forever. At some point, uh, we're going to look too much like Greece. And I think that point is coming soon. And, and your point about our, our spending as a percentage of GDP, uh, our revenue right now is only about 16% of GDP, and we're spending about 24%. So there's a massive gap there, and, and we've got to bring the two together and uh, to about 19% of GDP. That's where traditionally revenue has been, and uh, there's no proposal out there that gets anywhere near enough votes to do that. Um, even even the, the president's 
plan, uh, Paul Ryan's plan, it doesn't get you there for 10 years, even close. And, and that's with pretty optimistic assumptions. I, I think those assumptions are realistic if we take the measures that we do in the Ryan budget. But yes, you're right. That's are we going to tackle this? I mean, are we seriously after this election going to sit down and fix this thing? I think we have to. Uh, like I said, we're going to have a treasury auction and no buyers for our debt before long. And so we absolutely have to. And that's when Congress tends to make the decisions that it has to, that members of Congress will actually put their own careers on hold and take an unpopular vote. And, and there are going to be many unpopular votes that are going to come. I think it's going to happen because we have to. Back with Congressman Jeff Flake, running for U.S. Senate out of Arizona, Republican. Back in a minute with Congressman Flake. Arizona Congressman Jeff Flake is our guest on Newsmaker Sunday. We had Will Carton on last week, uh, both, of course, vying for the Republican nomination for U.S. Senate out of Arizona. Jeff Flake has been serving since 2001 in Congress, a member of the Republican Party, of course, and, and trying to replace John Kyle, who is retiring uh, after, what, three terms? Yeah. Three terms in Three the Senate. Three terms. You turned 50 in December. Right. Thanks, thanks for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any, anything you have... Really, uh, as you hit 50, it's it's a, you know, it's it's a marker. Is there something about 50 that you say, okay, here's what I want to do with the rest of my life? Well, in addition to turning 50 in October, our oldest son Ryan and his wife Lindsay will have our first grandchild, uh, and uh, so you're that's, a young guy to have that's grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's uh, our first, and and that that more than turning 50 has really uh, made me reflect and. Uh, and certainly, uh, as one who is, is in Washington and uh, in elected office, it really makes you think of what we're doing uh, for kids who are being born now, right now. Every child that's born uh, is born into about $50,000 in debt. Um, just that individual. The government puts an IOU on their head, right, right. when they come out of that's the womb. That's right. And, yep. and that really uh, it makes you think about why are we doing this? And it makes you want to look at every program we have and say, is this worth borrowing money uh, from this grandchild? Um, and because that's essentially what we're doing when we argue that we have to have funding to expand this program or to do this. We're basically telling our kids and grandkids, we're, we're going to put this debt on you. And that's not fair. I don't want to get into the endorsement game too much, but Rick Santorum on uh, Friday, the former right. presidential candidate, um, threw his support behind Will Cardin. Were you surprised by right. that? Um, yeah, uh, but, but not really. Um, Rick's a good guy, and uh, Will's fortunate to have his endorsement. And then conversely, um, you know, Will Cardin's kind of, I guess, a Tea Party guy. He doesn't get Sarah Palin's uh, roll tape number eight. He doesn't get Sarah Palin's endorsement, but you do. Right. And John McCain uh, is with you, so I, I, I don't know what to make of all this, and I don't know whether voters care that much. Well, I, I think it is important to have conservative support in a Republican primary, and we have that support. Um, the Club for Growth, uh, they've supported me in, in all of my races because uh, they know I'm committed to limited government. And then uh, Freedom Works, another conservative organization nationally, uh, National, National Taxpayers Union political arm uh, mm -hmm. is supportive as well. Uh, and then people like Jim DeMint and the Senate Conservatives Fund. And conservatives like Pat Toomey in the Senate and Paul Ryan in the House and uh, now Sarah Palin. Um, I'm, I'm very gratified and very grateful for this you, support. You vote with your party, the Republican Party, about, if my math is right, 89% of the time. Is that just about right? You know, You've got to leave a little wiggle room. Yeah, you should leave a wiggle room. It depends on the issues. I mean, when you look at some rankings, uh, like the Chamber of Commerce ranking, uh, I, people would think, well, you're conservative you're always going to vote with the Chamber of Commerce. That's not always true. There are some corporate subsidies uh, that the Chamber of Commerce thinks, uh, you know, those are okay. Mm -hmm. um, aid to uh, companies to promote their products overseas. That may be pro-business, but it's not pro-free market. And so I, I tend to try to vote free market. And then on, on the conservative scale as well, I, I have some issues like I think that every American should be able to travel to Cuba 
or anywhere they want that's to. That's right. You have, and, uh, you and have fought very hard to try to normalize relations with and, Cuba. And I don't, uh, I don't get a lot of support from uh, a lot of people in my party, but I think that that's the, the ultimate freedom issue. You ought to be travel, able to travel wherever you want. Why, is, why has Cuba been so high on your radar? Well, it, it just, it, it's not uh, that high. I spend uh, an inordinate amount of time on it, but uh, I've been associated with that because I think it's, people think it's strange that somebody from Arizona that doesn't have a tie there uh, but I thought that it's important to have somebody that's not from Florida, uh, somebody who is just concerned about the, the freedom issue. And I've always felt uh, those poor Cubans uh, ought to have contact with more Americans. It would be good for them, and it would also be good for Americans to see uh, what happens when government controls not just the commanding heights of the economy, but the entire economy. It's a sobering thing. Right now, the only people who go to Cuba and come back and talk about it are people like Kevin Costner and Oliver Stone and these celebrities who come back and, and laud the health care system or education. When if you go to Cuba, you'll realize it's a mess. And, and uh, this, this socialist experiment has failed miserably. And that's good for Americans to see. Um, also, I've always thought that if you want to get rid of the Castro brothers, make them deal with spring break once or twice. <laughs> you know, I mean, they, they deserve it. Let me, let and, me, and that would be good for them. Let me run tape number seven, uh, the Colorado shooting. And it got in and, and invariably gets into a discussion about right. gun control. Um, with what we saw there, are there too many of these assault type weapons on the street? Um, are, are, are these big magazine clips a problem? How do you view this thing? I mean, obviously, you've got a deranged guy. Right. But beyond that, then he's got the tools to, to carry out destruction. What's well, your take on it? Well, I, I think uh, to the extent that there are too many on the street, it's, it's uh, when laws have been broken already, uh, when they're there. And uh, I think if we enforce the laws that we have on the books, then we, we should be okay. I don't want to go... Uh, the other way too far, but where we're uh, impacting our Second Amendment rights. I believe in the Second Amendment, and I think we ought to protect it. Um, and we have laws on the books that haven't been enforced well. Uh, we should ensure that they are. And that more laws in this case would not have stopped this in your view. I don't believe so. Jeff Flake is our guest, a congressman from Arizona's 6th Congressional District, now running for U.S. Senate in the primary against Will Cardin and two others. Uh, back in a minute on Newsmaker Sunday. Final moments with Arizona Congressman Jeff Flake running for U.S. Senate. Um, let's roll tape number five. Um, Americans think Congress is broken. Um, do you believe that a, a guy going back there again, uh, you've, had, right. you've been back there since 2001. Mm -hmm. You'd be in a different body, the Senate, obviously, right. if you were to prevail. Can anybody fix this place? Well, I think uh, my record in the House is that one man can make a difference, and that's in a body of 435. Uh, when I got back there and looked at what we were doing with earmarking, uh, in particular Republicans, because we were in charge of both chambers in the White House. It was a system that was completely out of control. And uh, I went to my leadership, tried to get them to move on it. They wouldn't. Uh, and so finally, after a year or so, went to the floor of the House and challenged these earmarks uh, one by one. Uh, we would have what they called the flake hour after every appropriation bill. <laughs> and, uh, and I finally got a rule where... Uh, members had to put their names next to the earmark. That finally passed. And Does John and that, Boehner pull you aside and say, hey, Flake, cool it. You're well, ruining this thing for all of us. Well, uh, John Boehner himself has been anti-earmark, and so I think, but he gets pressure from the old bulls, some of the old appropriators. And at one point, after, uh, you know, I had challenged a, a lot of these, and uh, the appropriators got very angry. Uh, John Boehner was the one that informed me that uh, I was being removed from one of my committees as punishment for what he called bad behavior. See, this is um, why everybody, it seems, gets back there and goes along to get along. It, 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 it largely is, uh, because you do get punished. But in this case, I was right, and, and people knew it, and across the country people knew it. And within uh, two years from that point, I was not only, uh, you know, not only a uh, uh, put on the Appropriations Committee, but some of those same old bulls that had me removed uh, wanted to basically run as a ticket with me uh, yeah. to, to, to keep themselves on the committee. So th things come around if you're doing the right thing and you persist at it enough, then you can make a difference. So one person can make a difference. We've got 30 seconds. Um, what is it that you want voters to keep in mind? We're in voting right now. I mean, this election will be decided probably long before, um, what, uh, 
August 29th, is it 29th? 28th. 28th. Right. What this would you is, want? I want them know? to understand this is an extremely important election. These are high stakes. We have to have control of the United States Senate. Uh, so we can actually pass a budget there. We haven't had a budget in the Senate for over three years. And we have to have people who are willing to stand up, whether their party is in charge or the other party. Uh, and, and my record has shown that I will do that. And so, and we have a great representative now in the Senate, John Kyle. He's been great for the state. We have to ensure that there's not a void left when he leaves. Uh, on a lot of the Arizona issues as well that are important to us. Uh, He's been great. We need to replace him with somebody just good. To good to see you, Congressman Flake. Best of luck in the primary, and uh, we will see you all again next week on Newsmaker Sunday. Thanks for your time. Thank you.